Welcome to Novel Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. In the spotlight is Stephanie Story. She's young, she's energetic, she's physically animated, as I discovered on YouTube watching a few of her videos. And her name is Story, if you can believe that. She's a fiction writer. She writes novels, and her last name is Story. Now, whether that's an affectation or that's a bona fide surname, we'll find out. Uh, so just throw an E in between the R and the Y, and, and there you have it. Unless it's Story. I don't think so. Stephanie Story is the way it's pronounced, I do believe. But Stephanie's going to clean everything up I'm about to say. Her debut novel is Oil and Marble. It was hailed by the New York Times as tremendously entertaining. Uh, it's been translated into six languages and is currently in development as a feature film by Pioneer Pictures. So there you have it already. Um, reason for envy here. Uh, she's also the author, author of Raphael, Painter in Rome, which came out in uh, April 2020, in conjunction with the 500th anniversary of Raphael's death. So she knows pacing, she knows timing. She has a degree in fine arts from Vanderbilt University in Nashville. So she's a Commodore. She attended the PhD program in art history before leaving to get an MFA in creative writing at Emerson College. She's even studied art in Italy, which you know goes hand in hand with uh, her fiction writing, which is historical uh, historical fiction. It's art, historical art fiction. Uh, she's also, though, a national television producer and has been so for nearly 20 years in Los Angeles. Her husband's in the business as well. He's a, an, an actor and an Emmy award-winning comedy writer. You can imagine the guffaws in the story household. Uh, and the two of them like to travel the world in search of their next great stories. And uh, we're going to find out from Stephanie what the most fecund place she's ever been in the world is in terms of stories. Uh, I'll leave it at that and just say, Stephanie, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mike, for having me. That was quite an intro. That was a lot. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like blushing over here. Hey, you got a lot of questions to answer here, young lady. Uh, for instance, is story your real name? Or, I mean, was that just divine, uh, some divine insight or inspiration or did you did you adopt the name story for your writing career oh no that one's thanks to my dad uh, wow yeah, the, the only thing i will say is my husband whose last name is gandolfi did not allow me to take his last name because he said you're a writer and your last name story we can't change that <laughs> a wise man a wise man that was a good call uh so uh, salute to mike on that one uh, and I know that from what I've listened to, Mike is your first reader. You say he's got ADHD. Um, I think all writers have a touch of that, at least. And you were saying that if you can't hold his attention, if he gets bored, you know that you need to revisit the scene, revisit the pacing, revisit um, the interactions and whatnot. Uh, true? Well, not only is he a writer, but he's a comedy writer. So he has spent his entire career in sitcom comedy rooms or on the stage doing stand-up. So his attention span is approximately the length of a joke. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's it. That's all you get. <laughs> and so, it's a knock knock. Who's there? Scene. <laughs> okay, is, Mike. You're, you're gonna you're gonna like this one. <laughs> that is all. That is the entire thing. So he will read a chapter, and sometimes in the middle of chapters, he has been known to just hand it back to me and go, "No." <laughs> Yeah. So, okay. Okay. I gotta. I gotta go back to the drawing board. I didn't have enough stakes. I wasn't. I, I wasn't sort of turning the action fast enough. I had too much description. I had too much whatever. And uh, yeah. So he's he's definitely my first reader, and that's why. If I can keep his attention, and I know I will keep your attention when you're at home reading me late at night, and you're mad at me because you can't go to sleep. Because you have to know but, how it but, begins. Do you know what I mean? But don't, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I always believe that the ideal piece of writing I could ever do is somebody lays down in bed to read, to fall asleep, and instead they they throw my book aside because it's actually adding, it's additive. They're, they're becoming more energetic. I want my writing to have that kind of velocity yes. uh, that, that it energizes rather than is soporific. 
But let me ask you this. So Mike, you know, Mike doesn't have a long, he has a very short attention span. A lot of people do, but fiction readers, when you agree that fiction readers tend to be a little bit more patient and that maybe they're getting just cheated a little bit in those scenes where you want to, um, what's the word or the phrase, a dilly dally? No, I don't not dilly dally because that sounds like you're wasting people's times, but where you want to linger a little bit. I think it, it, it A, depends on the book. B, it depends on the reader, right? So there are some books that I want to read and I want to take my time. This is not fiction, but 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 the one that I think of is Ron Chernow, who writes you know great mm-hmm. histories of Hamilton and George Washington, and I love them. And I don't want them to end. They are very long. They have a lot of detail in them. That's what I want out of Chernow. Now, on the other hand, if I'm reading Ken Follett, I don't want to. It's a it's also a long book, right? Ken Follett tends to write, especially his historicals, tend to be eight hundred, a thousand pages long, like uh, the the Pillars of the Earth and his whole. Um, century series and fall of giants and all that. I want those, those to move because that's why I'm reading solid. Right. So, so it, I think it depends on the book and I just prefer a relatively quick moving plot. I mean, I do a lot of characterization. I'm trying to get to know Michelangelo and Leonardo and Raphael and these huge giants of history, and I'm trying to make them more human. So I do a lot of that, but all of the characterization for me tends to be built into a quick moving plot because I like to sit down and watch a movie. So I want my books to move like movies do. I want them to move with that pace. Um, Mm -hmm. It's just important to me as a writer. So I just think it depends on the writer. You know, um, before we go any further, I do want to point out that I can imagine listeners thinking, oh yeah, she's the La La Land TV producer. She's married to the Emmy award-winning actor. And she had a an entree with one of the biggest agents in town or agents in New York. But that was not the case with you, correct? No. You actually went out there, like any of us do, and uh, wrote a compelling uh, query letter and got the call. Yeah. No, I... Um... First of all, what you have to understand about Hollywood and the publishing world is they are two very different animals, right? So when you're working out in Hollywood, you don't know a lot of New York publishing house agents. That Those two things don't really overlap, particularly not when you are... I was a primarily talk and news television producer. So I was producing talk shows and news programs. Uh, so I didn't know any agents in New York. I didn't know anybody in the publishing industry. The publishing industry was completely foreign to me. I learned a whole lot when I moved into it out of television. Uh, so no, I had no entree into that. I had to do what everybody else does. I, as I was working on my book, I was also working on my query letter and I treated it like a trailer, you know, like Mm -hmm. tell the agents enough so that they're super excited. Uh, but don't tell them, uh, so much that they don't want to keep reading. You know, I tried to keep them aching for more to know what actually happened in the story. And so I wrote up a query letter. I researched agents who who also represented art historical fiction and agents who represented art historical fiction novelists who were early in their careers, right? I knew, for example, Tracy Chevalier, who wrote Girl with a Pearl Earring, right? She's huge. Mm-hmm. She's famous. Her agent probably wasn't going to take me on. Her agent's now too big to take me on. So I was looking for sort of lower level agents. And I sent out, I targeted five. I got requests for material from all five and ended up signing with my first choice based on a a blind query letter. They did not know me. Wow. So um, interesting. And, And for our listeners, Stephanie has got a how to write a query letter section on her website that is really excellent. Excellent. In fact, I want to make a future episode uh, out of that uh, uh, with uh, Stephanie's sanctioning. Um, Mm -hmm. But it includes this whole idea of of proper targeting and limiting your search and really uh, writing a cover letter that doesn't give too much away that leaves uh, that whets the appetite and leaves a person wanting more information and so on. Really, really good stuff. What what is your URL? Is it stephaniestory.com? Stephaniestory.com. Easy, easy. There you go. Yep. And story is, uh, you know, S-T-O-R-E-Y. And a British um, spelling. It's a British 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 way of doing it. My my dad's family was British. Uh Aha. Now, um, you and Mike travel, and when you travel, um, that's a source of inspiration for story ideas. 
What, where have you traveled to that, that provided the most fecundity of any place in the world? Oh my gosh. Well, it's everywhere. I mean, come on. Anytime you leave your house and you go someplace new, you find some new story. The post and office. You find it every <laughs> single time. When I go down the street, I find something new. So this is an impossible question. But yeah, okay. but, I, but but I will give you a couple of, of top answers because one is so obvious mm-hmm. um, that that it's just going to be boring because that's Florence, right? So my first mm-hmm. book is set in Florence, Italy. And the first time I went to Florence it was between my juniors and senior year of college. And I was studying at the University of Pisa through my university, through Vanderbilt. And for anybody who's been there, Pisa is about uh, an hour long train ride away from Florence. And that's when I went and I saw met Michelangelo in person. You know, when you see the David and it's like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, how <laughs> the angels sing. <laughs> yes, it's glorious. And then you're walking around this old city and the cathedral and, and the old roads that make you feel like, oh my gosh, Michelangelo walked here. Like this road hasn't been repaved. This hasn't been remade. Uh, so there was, there's something magical about, about Florence. I also feel the same way, frankly, about Rome. Rome has so many layers in it, which is why I was so excited to write Raphael in it. Like so many layers of history sitting on top of each other that you can't help but dig down and find previous centuries and previous eras lurking underneath every single step. I have to say I'm also madly in love with Paris as far as storytelling goes. The architecture mm-hmm. is so inspiring and just the people are so inspiring. I love that town. I think it's it it's gorgeous. But then like you know, you go to Fiji and it's completely different than than any place you've ever been and the attitude's completely different and it's gorgeous and it's this island and I think, oh man, are there artists here? Because can I write a book set on an island of Fiji? Because this would be fantastic. So, Are you always going to write about artists? Is that, I mean, that is your genre so far. Is that something that you will continue going forward because it's it's kind of a space you've carved out? I love it. So I, I care very deeply about the artistic process. So, so what I won't say is that it's always going to be painters or sculptors, right? I'm also interested in architects and I've been an actor for a long time. So I'm interested in acting. I'm interested in the ballet. I'm interested in, in writers. I'm interested in the arts in general. Um, so I, so, so I will say, I, I don't know that they will always be painters and sculptors, but I am most focused on the struggles that artists face when creating their world-changing masterpieces, whatever those masterpieces are. So Oil and Marble is is the story of the smackdown between Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. Is that correct? That's right. So for five years, they both lived side by side in Florence and they hated each other. And I'm so glad they did. Uh, because, uh, because <laughs> makes, makes much better copy. <laughs> it's a much better story. And because their rivalry drove them to create two of the most iconic works in all of Western history, the Mona Lisa and the David. That's right. Mm-hmm. Those two pieces of art were created in the same town at the same time by two guys who hated each other. And no one ever talked about that story. And I was like, that's it. Why? I don't understand why there's not a book or movie about this. This is crazy. This actually happened and no one knows it. So then I had to write it. But there's going to be a movie now, and we'll get to that in a minute. But Raphael, painter in Rome, is, it, is that also a, a conflict story? Oh, yeah. Well, that's primarily about the rivalry between Raphael and Michelangelo. So while Michelangelo mm-hmm. is painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling, Raphael is just down the hall putting his own masterpieces up on the walls of the Pope's private apartments. What's so different about Raphael is that one is told in first person by Raphael himself as though he's sitting across a tavern table from you, telling you about those crazy years when he went head to head against Michelangelo in the deadly halls of the Vatican. Nice, nice. And did he say, because I have not read the book yet, but did he say, look, I'm not the first guy Michelangelo's had a conflict with. This guy's a troublemaker. I mean, he can't get along with people or he's got too big an ego. Uh, We'll save that one for the I mean, look, the opening line of the book is why does Michelangelo always get to be the hero? So, yes, there's a whole lot of uh, why is this Michelangelo troublemaker guy so freaking famous? Why can't I I have a little bit of it? Come on, people. Uh, It's not all about Michelangelo. (laughs) So, go, yeah, there you go. Some jealousy there. Yeah, definitely jealousy and rivalry. 
Uh, it makes for great art. So uh, at least historically, uh, it's it's uh, that's been borne out. Now, Oil and Marble, getting back to Pioneer Pictures in a feature film, is that for, will that be on something like Netflix or, or Prime, or will it be on the silver screen in the theaters? Look, these processes, no one ever knows right until they're done. I've been out in Hollywood for too long to ever predict where things will actually go. I will tell you the Pioneer, who actually both owns the rights to both now, Oil and Marble and Raphael. Um, ah, so they are aiming for a, a movie theater, right? They are aiming for the big screen. They are aiming for that, but who knows where it goes. They have the, um, they are far along in development on oil and marble. That's all I can the, say. Those, those names are so big. When you're talking about Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, I can imagine the actors in Hollywood who are going to have a dogfight over trying to get the role, the, uh, one, one of those two roles. That would be great. Uh, well, for that matter, the director. that louder so other people can hear you. That would be fantastic. Yes. Let it re- reverberate through Laurel Canyon and Mulholland Drive. So um, let me ask you about... Um, the, I mean, was it your agent who went to Pioneer Pictures or got, not necessarily Pioneer Pictures, but went out there with it and found uh, somebody who said, yeah, this would work on, on the, on the silver screen? No, from the moment it was printed, we had calls from multiple companies just from the moment it was announced that the book was coming. Um, and then the company that I actually ended up signing with, they're great. I got through to, through a mutual friend who was also a producer on the project. So interesting. So, okay. So, in that so way, they saw they saw the potential right off the bat, and you write cinematically. It sounds like, or at least the pacing is cinematic. I try to write very cinematically. Certainly, Oil and Marble is super cinematic. It was intended to be that way. It was originally written as a screenplay, but I but but I will admit that having worked in Hollywood for twenty years, that's where everybody I know is. Uh, that tends to be why I have a lot of. Um, contacts and requests in that arena. So I don't, you know, whereas in the publishing realm, working in Hollywood did not make a difference. In the Hollywood realm, of course it does. These are all people I know and have worked with and continue to work with. So. Mm. So what obsesses you and what, and how does it manifest in your writing? What obs- Michelangelo obsesses me. I mean, see, I'm, so, no joke. Art history obsesses you. Is that right? Is it Michelangelo specifically or is it art history, the great artists of, in, in history? Um, I have a very special obsession with Michelangelo that has been around for about 25 years. So I have read every single thing ever written about him. I've been on a pilgrimage to see every single Michelangelo ever put on public display. I am technically missing one. Um The Crouching Boy at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, although its attribution is actually questioned by art historians. The Hermitage says it's Michelangelo, so eventually I'm going to get there to see it just in case. Um, But, yeah. Why Michelangelo, though? What is it about him that really lit your fire? Have you seen the David? Well, not – no, that's – I've been to – I don't know that I've seen the David. Where is it housed right now? Did you say Florence or is it in Rome? Florence, it's in the Academia. Okay. I have not then. I've, I've, I've seen tons of art in Rome and, and uh, I saw Da Vinci's, uh, what do you call the, the uh, drawings they do that are just kind of workups? Cartoons. Uh, well, not cartoons. Well, they were called something different. But anyway, the, the, he had an exhibition in, in, in Venice when I was there, but I have not been to Florence. So I'm going to have to see it. So that was, that was the piece that really uh, struck. I was 20 uh, years old. It was the first Michelangelo I'd ever seen in person. And if you ever see the David in person, you can't, I, I don't understand how you could not have the rest of your life completely altered for days and forever and ever and ever. Like, I don't understand. You, it's, it's a single block of marble. It's a single block of destroyed marble. I mean, it had been sitting outside in a cathedral workshop for 50 years in the wind and the rain and the snow. It should have been too brittle to carve. It was impossible. And it is the most perfect 17 foot tall object you've ever seen in your life. It is powerful and moving 500 years after the day it was, after it was finished, after it was carved. It is the most stunning thing I've ever seen in my life. So even though I had a love for art history prior to Michelangelo, Michelangelo is what kicked off the um, insane obsession. I mean, I've read everything I can read multiple times. He's, He's the love of my life. You know, my husband has to share me. Yeah, there you go. He's, he, yeah, exactly. Um, now you say flat out, I'm not, and I'm quoting Stephanie's story here. I'm not a historian. 
I'm not trying to be one. So in what ways do you bend history as a storyteller while still respecting history? Because you obviously know a lot about history, but you know, anytime you write fiction, you're going to bend history to some degree, but at the same time, you, you the way you care about it, you must respect it. So can you address that a little bit? Oh, I love the history, right? I wouldn't be writing it if I didn't love and respect and want to honor the history. I want to tell the truth of the history, right? It's just sometimes the details of that can make a story a little complicated. So sometimes I will move an event along a timeline, for example. Um, so if something happened uh, three months later, maybe I move it three months earlier just for pacing purposes, for example. Um, the other things that I do, of course, particularly 500 years ago, we don't have a lot of dialogue to work off of. You know, there are not like you, t- there, there's not like this conversation between Michelangelo and Leonardo. So I have to right, right. that. Now, oftentimes I will actually use uh, lines from Leonardo's notebooks as dialogue. I will use words from Michelangelo's poetry or letters in order to reconstruct dialogue and give those words to them in order to give you some like real flavor of who they were and the kinds of thoughts they had. Now I do, sometimes people like it, sometimes people don't. My language tends to be very modern. And I do that because I want people today to relate to my characters. I don't want the language to be affected. Two, I'm not writing in Italian either. So I'm already <laughs> I'm already not writing the way they spoke. They did not speak English. So the the, the the mystery has already been broken. Do you know what I mean? So yes. Um. So I so I do I do play with language a lot. And the other reason why is because at the time, you know, Dante's Italian was really becoming the Italian language. He he of course wrote hundreds of years before these guys, but but they all thought they were really modern speakers. They all thought of themselves as being contemporary. So I try to give them that contemporariness in the book. That being said, I do not have Leonardo da Vinci flying around the rooftops of Florence on bat wings. He did not have the capability to do it. That technology was not there. He, did he try to fly? Yes. Did he most likely fail? Did he fail? Yes. Um, so I, I try not to bend what was possible. Do you know what I mean? Like if it's impossible yes. for something yes. to happen, I won't do it. But if, but if it's, possible or plausible and it and it serves the actual story and the actual characters i will consider it now i know something else that obsess has obsessed you almost your whole life right? this is a statement from you i have written fiction every day since i was seven years old mm-hmm. that's a true statement yeah. and and i realize that you must have had the flu along the way and when you you don't mean literally every single day but one of the things you emphasize with people is you need to write every day because you also do coaching You coach writers and you say you need to write every day. But here you are, a seven-year-old. You obviously were meant to be doing what you're doing. What, I mean, can you, can you remember back to what really pushed you to sit down and put pencil to paper at, at such an early age? I will answer that. But first, let me go back. I do mean literally every day, including my wedding day before the dress went on, including when I've been in the hospital and including flus. I'm not saying what I write is good on those days or usable, (laughs) but it does get done uh, mainly because I have too much stuff living inside of my head. And if I don't put it down on a piece of paper, it would drive me nuts. Um, So, so I have to, it's right. It's, it's like breathing. I I don't know how it would exist without it. Um, What inspired me as a seven-year-old? I don't know. I sat down at my parents' kitchen table and went, I'm just really sick of not writing these crazy stories. I, I was a pretend player. I played all the time. I, I, I was constantly in my imagination. I, I had imaginary friends. I still have imaginary friends. I'm 47 years old. Um, and, and I still have them. I still talk to fake people. So I was sick of just talking to fake people and never creating anything out of it. I was also in art class. So I illustrated my first book too. It was called Horty the Hog Goes to School. Um, there was a whole series of Horty books. They did not get published. They're in my mom's garage somewhere. In storage, waiting to live another day. Let me ask you about a good writing day for you. What constitutes a good writing day? 
what has to happen during that day for you to say this was this was good? I am one of those, and I think there's a lot of writers. Like I don't think I'm I'm unusual. Um, I get up early in the morning, so I get up before other people, other humans wake up, uh, so that I can have really quiet time. So that that does range a little bit for me. I'm not like a every single. If I wake up at five and I'm awake, I will get up and go off in the next room, and I will write. Um, I'm always up by six uh, to write in the mornings. So I write for probably four or five hours in the morning. Um, wow. it just That's a long stretch. And then you have a full-time eight to 10-hour job. Not anymore. I used to. When I was producing television, I did. So when I was producing television, that time might be a little bit truncated because my television job was 60-hour weeks, right? It was too long to carry that. So I might get up before I was producing television and write for two or three hours. Now I can write for four or five because I'm a consultant. So I can truncate my working hours to shorter. I just like mm-hmm. consulting other authors and, and, and people in media. So it's the only reason why I still do it. It just sort of gets my brain out of my own crazy stuff. So if it's a really good writing day, I don't know. I've, I, I call it going down the rabbit hole. Do you know what I mean? Like, like you fall down the well and you don't know where you are anymore and you're completely in your other place. And you look up and it's been four hours and you don't know how that time passed because you were in 15th century Florence. That's a good writing day. The world disappears and you're in it and your head goes. Yeah. You know, white the blue pill or the red pill. Yeah. And, and, and you're gone yeah. and you're in it and you're in it for four hours and you look up and you go, well, I guess I get to go have my day now. All right. Thanks, guys. I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so. You said being a TV producer was plan B. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was plan A? Was it being a writer? Was it being a an artist? Yeah, the only thing an I wanted to do was be, a, was be a novelist. The only thing I've wanted to do since I was a kid was be, and I didn't just didn't think I could. I Everybody told me it was a hobby. It wasn't a real gig, um, that I would have to have a different job. Uh, that wasn't, I, people told me I didn't have the talent or the skills to do it. So I had to go off and, and produce television because people hired me to do that. At first. And then I didn't publish my first novel until I was 40 or yeah, 40. You know, and you said uh, something interesting that um, now this is when you were still working in TV production. You said uh, basically it's a very frenetic job. It's busy. You're, You're on the run all the time and you like to take your time with the books. You like to that. That's a place where you can luxuriate, uh, with the material. Now my word, not yours, but, um, you know, and I think about myself or I think about other writers who really want to get a project, you know, off their desk into the hands of an agent or editor. Mm-hmm. And um, because there's other projects that I have in mind, I'm sure there's other projects you have in mind. Talk about that whole process of, of uh, why you feel a sense of comfort working slowly and, and allowing that piece of work. And I'm not sure what the, your motivation is, whether you feel like it develops in a, in a more realized fashion over time, if you give it more time, it let it incubate or, uh, it's just, because that doesn't sound like your style, Stephanie, you are, you're amped, you are amped. Mm-hmm. You're a high energy uh, woman. Yeah, no, but, but I produced five nights a week of television for almost 20 years. I walked in in the morning, we put on a new show. The next day there was another show, Right. So I churned out content. I can churn it out faster than anybody. I can turn it around. But there is something really beautiful about making a stew. Do you know what I mean? Like putting all the ingredients in a pot and then watching them bubble and then going, okay, now I'm going to take this out and I'm going to add more stuff. And now it's going to change into this other pot. And I'm going to write 80,000 drafts. And by the time it comes out, It's going to be everything that I want it to be. I don't ever want to rush through a book. I don't like reading books that people rush through. I don't find them as fulfilling as one. And you can tell, can't you? Like like when they rush to the finish, it's like kind of like, hey, I'm at 90,000 words. Let me take 5,000 to just rush to the conclusion. And it's kind of like, well, that was unsatisfying. I always feel like I can tell the people who wrote on deadline. So I refuse to take a contract. Like I won't take a multiple book contract. I'm like, nope. I, I will finish the next one when I finish it. And if you want it, you want it. And if you don't, you don't. And that's okay. I'm doing this. Well, what is in the pot? 
for myself. What, what's in the pot now with the oregano and the uh, basil? <laughs> You, you're working on another project now, right? So you got some something stewing, something uh, something, something to still stewing. In. I love it. I will say that it's still a history, historical fiction about artists. I will say that I have left Italy and the Renaissance for now. So I'm in a different country, and I'm you're in, in Greece. I bet you're in era. Greece. I don't know. I'm in a different country, and I'm in a, in a different era. Um, and I can tell you that I am. Uh, what else am I saying about this? Am I saying anything else? I don't know. No. no. Well, I'll go out on a limb here. I think you said Paris earlier. I think you're working on Notre Dame, something about Notre Dame. And I don't expect you to share it with us, but I, I'm just throwing the prediction out there. So when your book comes out, we'll see. Because you like architecture as well and flying buttresses, I would imagine. So Notre Dame, and, and you're inspired by the burning of Notre Dame. So uh, no, I'm not a psychic, but... I'm just I'm just uh, using deductive reasoning here. I love that. Um, Do you know though that I have to tell you? So my husband and I, the very first time I went up to the top, I'd never been up to, up the bell towers of Notre Dame. My husband and I are in Paris in like March, and we go up for the first time. So it's the first time I've ever been, and it was fantastic. And we're taking all these pictures, and it's the most inspiring place you've ever been. And you just, it, it's just it's it's just one of those moments that just makes you giddy. Um, and we came back and that was right before I sat, I was, was sitting writing and the news came up and, and I watched, I watched the fire. So it, it's just one of those moments. Oh, you were in Paris no. when, it, when it hit? No. Oh, no. you were, this is on the back news. Home. Okay. When you were back in LA. We were back okay. home, but it was not separated by very much time. And otherwise I wouldn't have been to the top because you can't go up it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was astounding when, yeah. when I heard news about it mm-hmm. catching fire and mm-hmm. how serious that fire was. Um, so you say that this is part, I mean, again, you're a consultant, you, you teach people writing as well. Um, and you say that, you know, Hollywood 101, it's all about pacing and motivation. Keep the story moving. What's the motivation of the characters? What do they want? Uh, doesn't that mean, I mean, this is your style, so I can't, I can't fault it. You're obviously successful with what you do, but I also think about writers out there or other historical writers, people like James Salter, um, you know, does in his, my, one of my favorite novels, Light Years, the, uh, his novel Light Years about a married couple who at age 40, she says, I'm not living the life I want uh, and I, I want to, you know, go my separate way. And the novel's about them going their separate ways, but it, it uh, what, what I'm getting at is it doesn't that mean when you're so focused on pacing and motivation that you'd never get a novel that is more of a character study that is more of the sl- slow evolving um you know husband and wife who have split and are starting separate lives i, I I've never read the book you just referred to, however, in the way you described it to me, you described a want. I'm not living the life that I want, and I want something different. So we're going to go our own ways. That in itself is a driving motivational want that my hunch is holds that story together. If you mm-hmm. are not asking when you get to the end of the chapter what happens next, you put the book down and you don't come back to it. Now, that is true of every single novel I have ever read in my entire life. Is there a difference in pacing? Of course, some novels are slower and some novels are faster. Some novels are bigger and some novels are smaller. Some novels have all kinds of crazy plot and fires and floods and and wars and and all kinds of stuff. And some novels are based on one breakfast. But it doesn't matter. There's still a character want embedded in every single story or else you wouldn't be reading it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you say you put author notes at the end of your novels. Uh, What? And which which I is news to me. I haven't seen that before that I can remember. Uh, what are you hoping to accomplish with those notes? What what do they give to the reader? Author notes are actually really common in a lot of historical fiction, right? Because we are walking a line between what's real and what's not. So so my author line my, my author notes as a lot of historical fiction writers do detail what's fact, what's fiction, and where I played with that line a little bit. So I try to beat out, hey. This is real. This th- this event, I moved along the timeline. This actually happened. This is imagined, but here was my reasoning for imagining this scene. Um, here was my reasoning for making up this this ring that I made up or whatever. So it, 
it's the way to ground a reader once they're done with the book. And hopefully, I mean, my whole goal, a lot of historical writer, fiction writers goals is to give you a fictional story version that inspires you to go look at the real history. So when you get to the end of the book, you get to dive into the real history and go, okay, which parts of this are real and which parts of this are made up? And and where is the real history to help give you that grounding to know where to go look in your own exploration? If you're going to go read a nonfiction book, if you're going to go learn more about Leonardo or Michelangelo or Raphael or whoever. Um, it gives you that grounding to understand where the line was played with in a historical fiction book. I think they're really, I love them when, when I get them in historical fiction novels, when people tell me. Mm -hmm. So what's the greatest compliment? you've ever had from a reader or would like to get from a reader? What would be that greatest compliment? What would be the virtual marriage proposal from Michelangelo? Um, I hate you. I couldn't go to sleep last night because I had to finish your book. That's my favorite. That's the best. <laughs> Although I did have one woman tell me, one fan tell me she had read Raphael 21 times to help her uh, get through a tough time. That was a pretty big compliment too. Oh yeah, 21 times. Wow. Well, you obviously captured her. Uh, tell me about an author that really captured you. Name an author whose talent is so transcendent that you wish you could channel that person while you're doing your own writing. Is there such a figure out there? I have a lot of people I love, and I will answer that. I will say first, I don't ever want to channel anybody else. I am not anybody else. Um, I can't write like Margaret Atwood, although I love her. I could eat her books. I love her books so much. She is a glorious poet and storyteller. And it, 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 I love everything about her books. And I couldn't write like her even if I wanted to. And I don't want to. I love Nick Hornby. He's funny and quirky <laughs> and weird. And, and I, I, just, I love a new Nick Hornby book because I just know I'm going to enjoy the ride, right? I can't write like Nick Hornby, nor do I want to. Jane Austen. Uh, I'm, I am one of those girls who loves Jane Austen and has since I was young. I certainly don't want to write like Jane Austen. I don't think anybody would actually read that kind of writing anymore unless it actually is 19th century fiction. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I think that's mm -hmm. gone. Um, Ken Follett, I, I, I've talked, I've mentioned him before in this conversation. I love his writing. I think it's fast. I think he applies uh, like thriller movement and pace to historical. I think he does it really well. I admire a lot of what he does, but I'm not Ken Follett. So no, I don't want to chant. I channeled, I, I, I sort of enjoyed quote unquote channeling Raphael. I mean, but that was my voice. That was me writing it, right? Mm -hmm. Even though it was his, even though it was told in first person. Um, so yeah, that's my quick rant of, I can go on and on about favorite writers. Well, is there, uh, uh, if you were to name uh, one or two or three who influenced you most that really helped you find your own voice, uh, what would you say? Uh, probably all of those people and more. Okay, the ones you mentioned. Yeah. Okay. But, and and I don't know, F. Scott Fitzgerald, don't you just want to eat his words? Like now I'm back to eating books. Something about me is very <laughs> weird. Uh, today. I love the great guest. I, I <laughs> It was it wasn't my favorite novel ever, but uh, but it, I loved it. It was it was a, obviously a, a one a, a transcendent piece of work. Um, let me ask you about rituals. Are there any rituals you observe uh, in either your write either preparing to write or during the writing uh, process? Is there anything that's idiosyncratic about the the way you work? Because getting up in the morning and writing for four or five hours is that's that's pretty traditional. Yeah. Um, but is there something ritualistic that you, um, that, uh, I don't know. or maybe, maybe, maybe you're not, a, uh, or an eccentricity of some kind? I don't know if it's, if it's ritualistic because I am a sort of random person and I, I, I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't keep, I just don't keep stuff like that around a whole lot, but, but I wasn't kidding earlier when I said I still have imaginary friends that live in my head. So I really do. I, I won't write a scene before improvising it or acting it out or doing it to, to actually having actually engaging in the scene with how do you act it out are you doing this in, in your own head uh, you're seeing it oh no, you're visualizing I'm, I'm it up doing it oh so you're actually it's almost as if you're doing a stage play yes, and you're reading the myself. lines i'm all of the people mm -hmm. um 
But that's what does that mean. do? What does that do for you? I mean, you have a surplus of energy, so that probably helps ground you for one, I would imagine. But what does it do for you in terms of the of the writing? It helps me find the magic in the moment, right? So I'm also a trained actor, so I've been on stage a lot doing improv, and it helps me find those that dialogue and those movements and how the character's actually feeling in that moment. So if I want to, if I walk out of the room during my improv, if I walk off stage, then that character maybe is not going to stay on, stay in that scene as long as I need him to. And if I need him to stay, I'm going to have to find a reason that to keep him there. Right. So uh, it tells me a lot about how the character might move or might react or might speak or might feel in the moment because I just stay in tune with my body to know how that scene is impacting them. I don't know that I could write a scene without improving at first. Interesting. So what about outline versus organic development of a novel? Do you know where that novel's going ahead of time? Do you do an outline and, uh, or is it very much kind of a gesture sort of drawing? And then you, within those confines, you let it develop organically? How does that work for you? Considering I'm a historical novelist, I can't fathom organic because I'm writing about famous people where real events actually happen to them on a real timeline. I don't have a choice. I can't put Michelangelo in a market and go, okay, I wonder what you're going to go do. I know I have to know what he did. I have to know where he went. I have to, uh, uh, so many of those, at least the big tent poles of the book are forced and I can't get around them. I'm not going to change the date when the David was finished. I'm not going to change the date when he got the contract. I'm not going to change the date when, when Raphael finished a painting in comparison to when the Pope marched off to war. Those two things have to happen. So I have to have a pretty serious outline. And again, I'm, I, look, I was trained, I spent so much of my time being a screenwriter I am so ingrained in you, you, you end that chapter, you better be going, Oh, what's going to happen next? You, I, I just, I have that so ingrained in me that you, that I just want that. I love it when I'm a reader and I end a chapter and I go, Oh man, I really want to know, but I got to go to bed. Uh, those are the books I like to read. Those are the books I want to write. And you only get to that through an outline. I mean, I guess unless, I guess if you wrote organically, I think your rewrite process would be much longer. I think it would have to be because in historical fiction, particularly there's so much about the story that is forced. It has to be where it is. Name some, since you're in Hollywood, since you're in LA, you're in the TV business here and you've got a movie coming out and you've got a husband in the, in the business I want to ask about uh, movies that served as inspiration for writing, not necessarily directly into what you have written, but that really inspire uh, the writing process for you or get you fired up in terms of ideas and just wanting to get back to the keyboard. Amadeus. Oh, I love that movie. I think, Mm. you know, I I was young when it came out and it was so centered. I don't think I'd ever seen a movie at that point that was so centered on the creative process. Do you know what I mean? Like so many movies and books about artists are, are centered around their love life or something or something else. It's not centered around the struggle of the creative process. And so much of Amadeus was centered around this rivalry and the struggle of the creative process for both Wolfie and Scalieri. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, so I always, I always think of that one. The King's Speech. Oh, I loved that movie. <laughs> oh, it was so good. And again, it was like the struggle of speaking and having to work with somebody on through that, like personal, can I get over this angst in order to express myself? Right. That, oh, I, I, I thought that movie was so brilliantly done. Brokeback Mountain. Man, I thought that movie was brilliantly done. It was it was quiet. It was two people, uh, but the angst and the worry and the want that you have for those two people to make it, and then the uh, that movie is gorgeous. I'm also the right age and 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 am appropriately obsessed with Star Wars films, all of them. Uh, I am I am definitely one of those. Uh, oh, I man, I can keep going. Who the Godfather movies? I gave myself a masterclass in the Godfather movies one year. 
where I would watch them plot them, right? So I would write down all the plot and all the subplots. And, and then I would watch the the director's cut, you know, you know with, with all the voiceover. And I would take notes on that. And then I would go back and I would re-watch, re-watch the film. Oh, that was so... I learned so much about how to plot and how to move and how to handle a lot of characters and big themes by giving myself a masterclass in The Godfather. Those are the ones that come immediately to mind. So um, talk about the ratio between dialogue and expository writing. I mean, with Raphael, where you're writing in first person, I could see that being a lot more expository writing because he's telling the story that he lived and you're not going to put quote marks around everything he's saying. Um, do you have any feel for how, uh, what's your equation or what or not equation, your ratio in terms of, um, uh, expository writing versus dialogue? Uh, no idea. Um, I don't worry about that. I do what the story needs. Uh, my hunch is I'm much more dialogue heavy. Again, I, I wrote a lot of screenplays for a lot of years, so which is all dialogue. So my hunch is if I looked at it, I would be much more dialogue heavy. If I got into that kind of stuff mentally, like what's my ratio? How do I divide this? How long should the chapters be? How many, ch- like if I got into that stuff, I would drown myself in it. I would, I would really be, um, I would be too controlled by it. I, I would, I would have to hit those markers, quote unquote. I, I would have to hit those goals. And, I would, right. I would and it's too mechanistic. I mean, who wants to write that way? It's too, me- it's too mechanistic. Yeah. It, it would, it would take the joy out of, out of the writing. Right. But yeah, I'm amazed sometimes at, at the writers, there are writers who are very formulaic. They're very mechanical. They're very formulaic. Uh, they, they, know exactly uh, what markers that they want to they want to hit oh, and it doesn't sound like a lot of fun doing it that way good no, Pardon no, me? good for them maybe that's good maybe that would take all this angst and how long i take to write a novel out of it if i just knew what it was <laughs> supposed to be before i started it i mean i don't think i could do it that way but man i think that's great i think that sounds yeah. like an easier life if it works yeah if it works for you uh, I, I assume you've never had a writer's block. You've been writing every day since you were seven. So you've never had a lack, uh, b- b- uh, lack of material to go ahead and put on paper. I, uh, but- I know the feeling. So, so that's what I tell people. I've never had a writer's block because I don't allow it. But I know the feeling of sitting down to write and feeling like you have nothing to say or feeling like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to? I know the feeling. I just kick that feeling off my shoulder and write anyway. Mm hmm. You know, I, I know, uh, well, years ago I knew her. I don't know that she's ever been published. I tried to, you know, I Googled her and I, um, you know, looked on Amazon. I don't think she ever actually got anything published, but her characters would come to her in her dreams. And has have you ever had that experience where your characters kind of, they manifest? You have imaginary friends, you say. Um, so how uh, how big a role do they play in your dream state or your subconscious mind? It sounds like they play a significant role, but what does that look like or sound like? I dream about my movie, my books all the time. Like if, if I'm in that, if I've gotten the right one, I dream about them all the time. The, the best one, the best story, I mean, it's not the greatest story because it's sort of, you know, uh, I passed out once. So, so I pass out, right? And I, it was okay because one of my characters was with me. Like that, I was out, completely out. And I wasn't in my own like dream state. I was in one of my characters' dream state, which made the whole thing rather enjoyable. Uh, so I, I mean, and I don't know. I mean, now look, I think when I go to bed, if, if, if a story's working, I'm thinking about it when I go to bed and I dream about it at night and I wake up with a problem solved and I sit down and that's where my day starts, right? That's the ideal. I mean, that's what you hope is, is you've got an uncrackable problem at, at at the day before and you've thought about it for the afternoon and you've revisited it at night and you sleep on it and you wake up and your dreams solve it after years yeah, of Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. There's a technique for doing that, going to sleep with the problem on your mind, whether it's a writing problem or a life, uh, some other life problem. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you wake up in the morning and it's like, that's it. Uh, you know, the solution. Uh, or a breakthrough in terms of uh, uh, some kind of issue you may have uh, run into in the writing. To the aspiring novelist out there, what would your, um, who, who either maybe hasn't started his or her first effort or is in the middle of that, um, 
what uh, is your advice to them? Maybe a, c- a couple pieces of advice. Remember, somebody just starting out and getting going with it. If you're starting out and getting going, just sit down and write a story you want to write. And don't worry about the structure or how to move it or the ratio between dialogue. And <laughs> and, 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 don't listen to what Mike was talking about. It'll throw you off course here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't. Don't worry. If you're new to it, just sit down and write a story and find out how it feels to get all the way to the end. I mean, you should do that anyway, whether it's your first novel or your 800th, right? Yeah, don't think about the market, right? You don't want to think about the market because then you're going to write for other people rather than yourself. It's not going to work either. You're going to write something for the market. By the time you finish it, the market will have moved. Like, I don't exactly do that. Don't do that. So just unless you're historical figures, of course. They don't move. Yeah. They're set in, they're, they're, they're uh, monuments. They are set in marble and stone. You picked great subject matter on, on several levels when you think about it, because that's not a market that moves. You're yeah, dealing with the biggest names in art. And uh, on top of that, um, you've got, I mean, the level of interest yes, with market, figures like that around, is very high. But the market around historical fiction still moves. The market around the, the daily market, the daily publishing market, it moves. It always moves. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter whether you're talking. I mean, I had when I was out, when my agent was out on submissions for Oil and Marble, I had publish, you know, um, publicists come back from publishing houses and say, we don't think we can market this one. So I, it does move, and that's okay that the market moves. So don't worry about the market. The be- the best piece of advice that I still give to all of my students who are early: do not publish before you are ready, even though you can. I understand that there is a booming, uh, you know, self publishing industry, and that you can go get a publisher and you can hit print on your book. But if you are serious about having a career, even if you do choose to self-publish later, that's fine. I have nothing against self-publishing. I think it's great for a lot of people and a lot of reasons. But wait until it is of publishable quality. Wait. Write a couple of books. Do not get impatient or else you will shoot your own career in your foot. Because when you finally do get a good one and people go back to your you know, your, your backlist and they read older books of yours, they're going to go, well, this writer's not very good. Why am I reading them? <laughs> you put your junk out there. I have, I, have, I have seven novels in a filing cabinet that will never see the light of day. You know, don't, don't rush. You're gonna, you're gonna do more damage to your career if you want a career. Now, if you just want to put a book out to put a book out, put a book out, put a book out. Great. Awesome. If you want a writing career, wait. Wait until you are ready. Do not rush. What about finding your voice? When, when did you find your voice? Did you feel like it was always uh, the the real article when you would write, even from the time you were a child, because you just naturally said what was inside you? Or did you get to a certain stage or age where you felt like this this is, uh, you know, finally, it's this is the clarion. I can hear it. This is my voice. Uh I was always worried about my voice, didn't think I had one, didn't even understand what it was, really. I was like, what are people even talking about their voice? Like I I wrote books like oh, oh, you were you asked this question earlier about which books like influenced me. And I said, mm-hmm. I don't I don't want to channel anybody. But when I was young, I wrote a, a novel like Wuthering Heights. I wrote a novel like like I wrote like Virginia Woolf. Like I practiced writing mm-hmm. like other people in order to learn to improve my craft and just to, just as fun too. It was just sort of enjoyable to try to write an E.E. Cummings poem. Um, It was just a weird challenge. So I did that for a long time. I don't, I think I finally found my voice when I went to acting classes because that's so about finding your perspective on things. And that made more sense to me the way it was taught in a theater made more sense to me. Oh, I'm supposed to have a point of view. I'm supposed to have an opinion. I don't know that I really found my voice until I published, like until Oil and Marble, which is quite, again, I was, I was technically 41. It's the reason I sort of backslid on 40 earlier, but I, so I was 41 when Oil and Marble came out. I was 40 when it sold. 
And I, I think that's the first thing that I wrote. And I've written so much stuff and I had finished screenplays and I had them out. Um, you know, I had them out. I was, I was, I, they were in development. I was writing things that were sort of getting picked up, but I don't think I, I really found that until I went into a theater, which forced me to look at my own perspective and my own self. And then came out mm-hmm. with Oil and Marble. And Raphael, certainly, I, I found my voice. So maybe not until then. I don't know. It takes a lot. And isn't it always changing? Do, do you just find it and then you're done? I don't think so. I think that always moves. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think and for some people, I think it does. Um, I think for others, I, I don't know. When I think about myself, I think in terms of I mean, I'm a journalist and that actually works against fiction writing because mm-hmm. you are structured and you are, tr- you know, there's a certain journalistic tone and I tend to over describe things and so on. That's the sort of thing that can hamper writing. And uh, there are times when the voice does come through and it's kind of like, that's what I need to do more of. But but there's kind of this natural instinct to shrink away from it because of my training yeah. and because I practice it every day. So um, let me ask you about this piece of work that you're on right now. When do you, which, which is under wraps, mm-hmm. um, but it's going to be art based, mm-hmm. historically based. When do you expect to complete it? Do you, do you know, uh, are you under contract on it or is it the, Hey, it'll be done when it's done. And it's somewhere between one and five years. I don't do contract, uh, period. I, I won't write like that. Uh, novels. I'll, I'll, I'll produce a television show under contract. You have to. Um, uh, I don't know. It's, it's very far along, but it is in the midst of a, what I would call a restructure. So I have multiple drafts, but something fundamental about it shifted for good reason, which is part of the reason why I like taking my time. It gives it time to find its feet and to say, you know, we all, we, we, we're all living through a global pandemic, right? And even though I'm writing about things that happened hundreds of years ago, my perspective has still changed based on what we have all experienced over the last two years. And if I didn't honor that perspective change, I wouldn't be honest with myself or with the finished product. So the perspective shift that happened for everybody through the pandemic, I think, shifted sort of a fundamental piece about the next project. And so I'm, I'm doing a restructure. So I don't know, a couple years, year, two, I don't know. Mm-hmm. We'll see. Now, uh, final question. I just want you to em- envision you're having a dinner party. You can invite any three people living or dead. Who are those three people? And what is the question you want to ask each of them? Oh, I have Maybe a different question for each. each. I have to have each, each of them a different question. Well, Michelangelo has to be there because I can't throw a dinner party and not ask Michelangelo. That would be sacrilege. Uh, so I have to ask him. Um, honestly, my husband has to be there because like, and, and that sounds crazy, but uh, he's so inventive in his brain. And I, we work off of each other really well. And so he would help me guide the conversation, which would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then, oh man, who am I going to say? I'm going to throw, what do you want? I'm I'm, going to throw Sarah Bernhardt into the mix. (laughs) So Michelangelo is the guy. He's the one that needs to be there. And and your husband, Mike is the guy. And Sarah's, uh, Sarah is, are you sure that Mike and Sarah will just, will, will just cut up the whole dinner. They'll be cutting up the whole dinner. Yes. What can it, you imagine what? Sarah Bernhardt and Michelangelo at the same dinner table? Oh my <laughs> gosh, that would be the it's greatest. Hard. So what is the question? The one, if you could ask Michelangelo one question, what, uh, what question would that be? Is there something during the writing of the book where you were thinking, if I, w- I wish I could just, he'd come to me in my dreams and answer this for real? Uh, looking back, what was his greatest triumph at the end of his life? And I, and I would ask the same question of Sarah. You know, they, they, had, they both had so many triumphs throughout their life. They both had so many huge moments that you could point to. But what was, what was most important to them and and why 
And and I mm-hmm. just I just think it would connect back to um what 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 they felt like their biggest struggle was and how they got to the other side of that. You know, I I, th- I think when you find out what someone's biggest triumph is, you also find out what they overcame to get there. Yeah. Yeah. So one more quick one, because we're uh, you have a hard stop at the top of the hour. Um, the uh, what kind of writing day was today? You got up and you wrote today. Was today a good day? Was today a great day? Was today a run of the mill day? Today was an interesting day. So today I got up and like I said, I'm in the middle of a restructure. And so it was restructuring act two, which is like the beast, right? I mean, it's like the long desert in the middle of your book. You know the beginning and you know the end, but the desert in the middle. And I was doing some restructuring on the desert in the middle. And I realized that uh, the stakes aren't climbing properly. And, And having to really go in and hold my own feet to the fire about, um, forcing that and and finding the answer of why this matters to each of the characters, why they care to, to be doing the things that they're doing, why they need it. Um, so it was, so it was a deep dive morning of, of getting serious with myself about an issue that I have to solve, but that's also a good writing day because I found a problem that I know I need to solve. So I don't know. It was a day. It was a day. You did your. You did what you needed to do. Uh, best of luck with this new project. Congratulations on uh, your first uh, two novels and also the forthcoming movie uh, adaptation of, of Oil and Marble. Uh, Stephanie Story has been our guest. Stephanie, this was a lot of fun, and I knew it would be. So thank you for taking the time. I know you're busy, and I really appreciate you taking the time. This was fantastic. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you having me and talking to writers about writing.